My name is Patrick Dillon. I'm doing this interview because uh, I assigned myself the job after 9-11 to try to find out what actually happened before, during, and after the attack so I could properly identify the people that murdered my best friend, who was a captain, Fire Captain Patrick Brown, who was a Vietnam vet as I am, two tours as a Marine. He became a fireman after he came home and got the call on the morning of 9-11. Uh, he had finally got his own firehouse, uh, Ladder 3 on East 13th Street, raced over to uh, Twin Towers. The plane had already hit in the upper part of the building. Uh, the elevators weren't working. They ran upstairs with uh, tanks and hoses and began to cut the fire down. And at some point during the early part of that, they radioed to the ground that they had, quote unquote, put the fire out. And it was burned and wounded people inside on the floors that they were working on. They wanted to know from the ground what the orders were to stay up there with the wounded, bring the wounded down. He was trained as a Marine not to leave anyone on the battlefield, so he did not get an answer from the ground because the radios failed miserably. Uh, there were the cheapos that Giuliani would not improve on uh, budget-wise. There were Motorola. They failed on the ground. They couldn't hear them, so they stayed up there. After the fire was out, quote unquote, I heard the radio reports of this. So he put the fire out, so the building does not come down at that point. Something else was brought to bear. The building comes down. In my opinion, thermate was used. I'm working on that kind of evidence through the uh, doggedness of trying to find out who actually killed him. Tower goes down, I get the phone call from his other best friend that he's uh, down there somewhere underneath the pile and I race down there on my two wheel with a big bag of tools and harnesses and rope and uh, basically bullshitted my way into the, into the site about an hour after the towers came down and, and we immediately started digging through the rubble and through the wreckage to try to find survivors including my best friend. I thought he would be the one to, to live through it because he had started studying yoga. He had become a, a very devout and very devoted yogi, was in tip-top shape, and uh, if anybody could have lived through it, I thought it was him. And I started going down with a harness and on into the North Tower pile. Could you describe the pile? The pile was a smoking uh, ruin of, of, of steel and piles of concrete and, and the air was filled with silica dust and, and, and smoke and the steel we all kind of noticed but didn't pay much attention to it was in very similar lengths apparently about 30 feet and had beautiful 45 degree cuts in them which we didn't notice that much at that point because we weren't looking for evidence of anything at that point we were looking for survivors. I was called off the pile to help with a survivor that they were getting out of the South Tower who had survived the South Tower collapse. She was John O'Neill's bodyguard. She was a Czech national who worked for the Port Authority um, and she had survived. They were all in the bunker together. Apparently after the North Tower was hit they all assembled inside the control bunker underneath the South Tower to see how this was going to progress and what exactly was going on. At one point before the South Tower had been hit by an airplane, apparently she, she saw John O'Neill get a cell phone call inside the bunker. He listened to the call, clicked off the cell phone, and then said to everyone else around the bunker command table uh, that, quote unquote, they were controlling the planes from the ground. Someone's, someone said this cryptically, I don't know who, I don't know who the phone, you know, the phone call was made by. She didn't either. I didn't identify her till months later. I just helped them get her out of the South Tower bunker and cleared her throat and cleaned her up a little bit while they took her off to the AIDS stations, which was over by West Street or something. She was covered in, in, in filth and dirt and, and was coughing and choking. I, I don't know how much blood was there, but she, and she wasn't badly injured because she was moving around and talking a lot and kind of hysterical. So she wasn't badly hurt. And I only, know this part of it by, by uh, meeting her months later. 
at a book launch. I had co-written a book about Somalia and about humanitarian aid, and this woman came up to me after the book launch, and my, my part was to read the passage and the chapter that I had contributed to the book, and she said, you saved my life, in a very heavily uh, Czech-accented, you know, jolting uh, kind of um, hello. And I, and, I, and I said, well, that's great. Who are you? You know, I'm glad I saved your life, but I don't even know you. And she told me who she was and what happened on 9-11, and then she walked me through Soho while she's telling me about the phone call that uh, her boss, John O'Neill, had gotten. And now the background O'Neill uh, that I know about uh, through my own research and some other, there's a book uh, written about him. He was at, at some point the FBI's uh, number one Osama bin Laden hunter. Bin Laden had been identified as a, uh, an asset who had turned on his masters and had begun helping the Taliban uh, move toward power in, in Kabul. And uh, John O'Neill and his crew had surrounded them at Tora Bora in the caves and was about to capture Osama bin Laden and was called off the hunt by his superiors in Washington which made him quit the FBI in disgust and uh, quickly was named then the head of the uh, Port Authority security systems. Was was uh, inaugurated on the night before 9-11 on 9-10 at the, at the windows of the world, uh, ironically. And he remains a, a, a mystery figure in this whole thing because of his connection to Osama bin Laden who was accused then of quarterbacking the entire attack. John O'Neill is dead, everyone else in the bunker is dead. She's telling me this story about the uh, controlling the planes from the ground, which was designed as, as technology to override the fad of hijackings in the 70s and 80s in the Middle East and other places. When the explosions occurred that killed him, where was his location? He was in the bunker underneath the South Tower in the basement of the South Tower, in its, own, in its own separate area, away from the parking lots and the commercial stuff. Command center, it was called, I think, command bunker, um, which is where they all assembled after the North Tower got hit, trying to sift through what exactly was happening. Was this a terrorist attack? Was this an accident? No one really understood or knew at, at a point within the hour of the first plane hitting what it was, the scope of it, who was involved, or any of that wider information. They were in the dark, no pun intended, for the, first, for the first beat of this whole thing. What is this? What is happening? Who's doing it? And why? Right? The, f the cell phone call remains, for me, a key piece of evidence that some quarterbacking was being done, that those planes were not being controlled by 19 inexperienced Wahhabist teenagers, that those nose cones were being guided by someone on the ground, possibly near or in the zone of the terror attack downtown. But further, you're saying that his telephone call was coordinated with somebody making the decision to... A good person, perhaps, was telling him a piece of information he needed to know, because he had three or 4,000 people that he had to deal with at that at that panic moment, you know. Do we get him out of the towers? Is this a terror attack? Do we evacuate the towers? All these questions are put in front of him in, in second to second, beat by beat, decision making, crises, you know, and he's in charge. He's the head of, the, of security for this, right? Epic, historic moment, right? It changed everything. No one knew what was going on, except people did know what was going on. Was it the Saudis? Was it Saudi intelligence? Was it the Bush administration? Was it Dick Cheney? Was it, uh, you know, the Bush family? No one knew. Well, certainly John O'Neill didn't know because he wasn't part of it. And he was dead within about a half hour because the South Tower came down, killed everybody except this, this uh, bodyguard. And she's chain smoking and telling me this as she steps down into the subway system and I've never seen her again. I go back up to the North Tower pile and continue to go down and sift through this wreckage, piercing the voids, as the firemen told me to do. Like go down with the harness, drop down lower and lower, find openings in, in this massive, hot, 
steaming pile of rubble to f possibly find human life, right? I dropped down once into a big void that turned out to be the part of, a, of an office that had kept shape, a room in an office, had stayed in its integrity. And I thought I saw office chairs, black office chairs, and I looked more closely at them and they were human beings that were charcoal broiled from massive amounts of heat and that's not fire or heat, it's something else. Some major th thermate or thermite kind of heat cooked these people to the point that they look like uh, briquets preparing for a, uh, a barbecue. I raced up from there, started screaming about this to get body bags and stumbled down off the pile and saw people coming in out of the, the Building 7 lobby and stumbled into the lobby of the building like I am now choking and spitting up you know, silica and dust and I was feeling like my lungs had become a couple of bags of concrete. And I sat down inside the lobby with a bunch of other first responders who were also just shaking their heads and covered in dust and spitting out the poisons and just shaking their heads and wondering like, what are we doing? What's going on here? You know? And we just sat there shaking our heads. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Then a crew of battalion chiefs, big shots come into the lobby. And my father was a battalion chief and I knew what they looked like because they have the white hats with the gold band across the hat. My father had retired, but I knew what they looked like because they were big fellas, big Irish looking, red faced uh, battalion chiefs. And they come into the lobby with bodyguards who were dressed in black with black ski masks and Uzis. And they said to us, everybody out of the lobby were pulling the building, right? Ordering us out, and in demolition terms, pulling the building means demolishing the building. We are demolishing the building. And as you may have seen, uh, you know, Larry Silverstein says the same thing on film after a phone call from one of the f people in the fire department. They told me, they had to pull the building to avoid more loss of life. And he used the same term, pull the building. We leave the building and I start going back up to the point where I was working on the North Tower pile across the street. And I turn around and we see Building 7 just settle perfectly into a Houston Astrodome-like footprint of its own. And it was demolished and fell at free fall speed, 5.6 seconds, into its own footprint. Didn't topple over, didn't explode, was never hit by an airplane, was never damaged much. There was a couple of little office fires on the 13th and 33rd floors. That was the extent of Building 7's raison d'etre for demolition. And it was demolished as this deathbed confession uh, refers to by the CIA spooker who is an expert in demolition and explosives who claims on his deathbed to have been the guy to do the job in the four months preceding it and was worried at the time that it looked too much like the Houston Astrodome and too professional um, but that got blown past and of course no one ever said a word about Building 7 in the 9-11 Commission report. No one ever explained why it went down or what brought it down. It just was ignored as was a ton of evidence that would have indicted Washington itself for the killing of Jack Kennedy. It's the lie of omission. I watched that happen and continued to dig and, and never found my best friend. He was found three months later without his head they identified him because of his bunker gear with his name on it. When they brought him out, his other best friend identified him and he said he still had the bulldog chest of a, of a Marine. I have spent the year since then trying to assemble evidence surrounding an indictment of the real killers of, of Patty Brown. And I will continue to do that whether it puts me in jeopardy or not, I don't care. I want to find out who, who gave the orders, who designed it, who quarterbacked it, and then who was the contract uh, assignees, the paid uh, 
assassins of my of my best friend and th almost 3,000 innocent civilians. Patty Brown's radio reports are part of the record, and I can hear him. We put the fire out. We put the fire out. The fire's out. We got hurt people up here. We got burned people up here. Over. Over. Like that, you know. What do we do? What do we do? Come back. Come back. And he's pretty frantic, but he's clearly Patty um, asking for, um, you know, there's a, a chain of command, and he's asking, he's asking them for permission to bring them down and get them out of harm's way, or what? Tell me what to do. He's asking the higher-ups, um, as he should. You know, he, was, he wasn't a battalion chief, he was a captain. Putting the fire out means no pancake theory is possible. The steel isn't weakened by intense heat, as the pancake theory is, is, is told. No one on the ground, after both towers came down, saw one stinking piece of steel to support the cores. The cores of these two were built very, very, very you know, strong to withstand hurricanes and two airplane uh, impacts. The cores were blown out and disappeared along with everything else. Right. The cores were, 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 were steel, like four by four feet by four feet steel columns going all the way up through the towers. Not a bit of that was left after, after either tower came down, you know. They were blown up. They weren't melted by anything known to man except planned and, and, and painted thermate or, 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 you know, all kinds of other stuff that's brought into bear when you, when you were trying to take something that big out, you know. The cores were gone. Just see the, you know, the steel cores of them standing there like skeletons. They were gone, you know. By, by what force? Thermate, it's called. You know, it goes from zero to 3,000 degrees in, in about three seconds, and it melts and cuts steel like butter, you know. But it has to be, it has to be thought out and thought through and, and, and applied to the cores. Now, I often explain to people that the way the buildings were built, they built the cores first, mm -hmm. and in the corners of the, f of the cores, they attached cranes, and mm -hmm. they built the building around that. That's right. The elevator shafts were among the cores. That's right. And therefore, demolition crews riding atop elevators would have access to the core columns in the corners of the elevator shafts, so they could attach thermate cutting charges mm -hmm. every 30 feet to accomplish this convenient 30 foot length for quick loading onto flatbed trucks and in fact you saw these 30 foot lengths all over the place. That's what happened. What you're describing is in theory that's what happened. Right? Every single first responder that I know reported multiple explosions throughout the whole building, especially down on the bottom where, you know, where the base of the buildings are, you know, multiple explosions were reported. Boom, 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 one of the firemen goes, you know. Preset, you know, these are, these are designed to weaken a thousand foot structure, you know, and have it go down once again into its own footprint, both of them, you know. And every single building employee that I talked to and news media talked to said, Things were going on in the six months previous to that where they would shut the whole power system down of the entire towers on weekends. No one would tell us what was going on. People were coming in and out with no IDs and, and stuff like that was actually happening, you know. And, and, the, and the employees would ask questions and then they were told, to, you know, just shut up and do your job, you know. So who was that? Was that Securitech? Was that Marvin Bush's company? Was that controlled demolition, you know, the contractor? Who, who was that and what, what was going on? Is, is the essence of who did it. If you follow it that way, as, a, as evidence and as, as, as a journalist would, as I'm trying to do, eventually you get to the green light crew in the star chamber of what? Washington or um, some other ruling establishment that comes from on high with the orders to execute whatever it is, uh, 
the project for the new American century. You know, the, the oil paradigm, paradigm has to remain central to our gravy train. We have to rationalize a Reichstag fire or some other Pearl Harbor-like attack to go into the Middle East and take all of that hostage again, including all the dark metals that are now being talked about in Afghanistan. You know, all of the metals used for the, um, the cell phones and the, and the laptops and all of that technology requires metals that are, that are sitting in Afghanistan in raw form right now to the tune of $15 trillion, according to the CIA. The CIA also did the studies to uh, put numbers on the, the amount of oil still in the ground in Iraq and, and the rest of the Middle East to the tune of 300 billion barrels still there. And they made, they had to figure out how to eliminate solar and other um, uh, forms of um, wind power and, and sustainable power in order to maintain their uh, economic grip on the global economy and do it in a way that terrorized the American people and put half of them in uniform going after another shibboleth made up enemy called the Arab. The Arab, the Muslim, the Islamo-fascist. And it's still being shaped and organized by, by Trump and his crew. Lee Harvey Oswald, Sirhan Sirhan, James Earl Ray, Osama bin Laden. This is the template. Hanging on a patsy and, and enriched a patsy with all kinds of anti-American and un-American salsa. And you've got a goose-stepping population falling right in line with the Kool-Aid of the moment. Osama bin Laden was brought into the fight against the Russian colonial attempt on Afghanistan. Well, hold on. Um, I, I would according to use a different language. Okay. I would say that the democratically elected government of Afghanistan was being subject to U.S. sponsored terrorism designed to get the democratic government of Afghanistan to request the help of Russia. So it wasn't an invasion by Russia. They were asked to come in, and that was the U.S. plot to cause the Russians so much military economic disaster that they would bring down. Russia's the Vietnam, right? Uh, I was in I was in Moscow when the Soviet Union collapsed. There were Afghanistan war vets in wheelchairs with no legs and the same. Uh, look and long hair even and uh, you know those the uh, bush jackets that we wore coming home from Vietnam the same kind of look and the same kind of guys surviving Afghanistan in Moscow in, this, in, in some of the squares wondering if they would ever get their benefits again um, because they had survived the war but had been all chewed up like we were by Russia's Vietnam and it was once again it, it was a perfect opportunity for Washington to to uh, implode so the Soviet economy by a protracted, blood-drenched colonial atrocity that wore the Russians down, wore the R Russian military down, and bankrupted the Russian economy at the end of the day, and collapsed the Soviet Union. Afghanistan was all of that and more. Osama bin Laden perhaps a mercenary, perhaps an opportunist, perhaps a believer in, in some of that or all of that, was an asset quartermastered by um, Charlie Wilson and others and armed and paid handsomely to fight with the Mujahideen side by side against the Russians. And believed in it, I guess, uh, you know, he was a devoted um, uh, Mujahideen himself apparently at some point uh, believed in his religious um, cause, if you will, you know, the cause of the caliphate, the cause of the anti-colonial Western ideas that were being imposed on the indigenous Muslim and Islam people of Afghanistan, and then got betrayed. They got left hanging out to dry 
abandoned after they were used up and used by Charlie Wilson and the CIA and the American international colonial reach. Uh, just walked away from them and left, you know, left them hanging out to dry, left, left them f f for dead. And Osama possibly realized that he had been betrayed and maybe turned on his masters like a lot of them, like, you know, Gaddafi and others have been betrayed and realized that they were being used and abused by, by the, you know, the colonialists and the, and the um, internationalists for other reasons besides beliefs and ideology, you know. The people that do these things are not doing them for for ideas. They're doing them for money. At the end of the day, this is about this is about raw materials and markets and gravy trains and and what's in the ground in Afghanistan and what's in the ground in Iraq and and other places like this. This is not about democracy and uh, nation building. This is about serious cabbage that's at stake and controlled by a class of people that will do anything, including murder their own people and attack their own populations and kill presidents and presidents' brothers and other leaders if they have to, to eliminate any threats to their, to their paradigm of power. I don't know their names yet. Yet. I'm working on it. Do you find it... I, I was going to say ironic, but I think there's better words. The the trouble the U.S. is having in Afghanistan as we replace the Russians in there. Well, yeah. I mean, um, history repeats itself the first time as tragedy, the second time as farce. I think it's the exact quote from Hegel. Um, I will say this to that. The people that, that do these things never suffer. The, the soldiers suffer. We suffered in Vietnam. We came home with the war in my head. The war in my head was worse than the war on the ground for many years. They never suffer any of it, right? The, the soldiers in, in, in Hamad, the soldiers who fought for ideology, for the belief, you know, for, them, for, for each other, for themselves, for the idea of liberating Afghanistan from the Taliban and, you know, the attack on 9-11 and, you know, revenge, justice, and all of the things that put these kids in, in uniforms is what they went there with as, you know, as, as burning uh, flames of true belief, as I was going on the plane to Vietnam, you know. But the people that design these things, the people that benefit from these things, never suffer. They never go there. They never, you know, they, they weren't in Fallujah. They weren't in Saigon. They weren't in uh, Khe Sanh, like my friend who uh, buried himself under all the dead bodies of the other Marines to survive the siege of Khe Sanh when the v Viet Cong showed up and walked around executing anyone that was still living. And he was buried underneath the bodies, full of shrapnel, and survived and came home deeply traumatized with the pieces of metal still in his body. And he came home to Harlem and picked up morphine and had a long career with China White. That's Kenny. That's my friend. Was he the son of a rich person? No. Was he a Bush? No. He was just Kenny from, from, from 117th Street and committed suicide, jumped in front of a train. So to answer your question, yes, it's terribly ironic that, that the American blood and treasure is now being wasted once again as the Russian blood and treasure was. But they're still going to get rich somehow off this. You know, they're planning World War III right now around getting richer. They always get richer. And we get to do the dirty work and, and we're the blunt instrument, the working class. The, you know, the cannon fodder is sent with Kool-Aid heads filled with dreams and, and, and hopes and, and, and ideals, as Patty Brown was as a Marine, as I was, as all the kids who, who joined after 9-11 were, to turn Baghdad and Kabul into the same thing that 9-11 looked like downtown, you know, reducing those places to ruin as revenge, as payback, completely insane completely ridiculous, completely tragic and, and, and horrific 
for the soldier and civilian alike. But the people, once again, who are up above that, in the, in the choppers flying around it, checking their stock prices, are richer than ever. Um, war is a very, very, very lucrative business. And Trump's crew is now just filled with big dreams about, about how much they're going to make off World War III, how much they're going to make off the nuclear strike against North Korea, how much money they will make off uh, what could be an existential moment in the history of the human species and believing that they will survive and they will thrive and they will get richer than ever. That's what they do. That's what they teach them at Wharton. Opportunistically cancer tumorist scum. They believe they will have more power and more wealth at the end of the day. No matter how many more Americans appear on how many more Vietnam walls and whose families somewhere in the farm rust belt of the heartland are crying and weeping and sitting in cemeteries as their boys and girls are lowered into the ground. That doesn't matter to them. Ivanka Trump and Donald Jr. are not going to be in uniform, I can tell you that right now. Or Baron Trump. They won't go anywhere near a, a war zone, I can guarantee you. Or Donald, who got five deferments for bone spurs while playing three sports at Penn and calls himself a big military man now, as Colonel Kurtz would say, the horror, the horror, the horror. <laughs> now, you, again, were a witness at Ground Zero. I got there about an hour after the towers came down. Okay because I got the call, Patty was in the North Tower. And you were saying that there was regular 30-foot regular length steel around? There was, there was big pieces, uniform length. We noticed that. What else was there and what wasn't there? There wasn't stacks of floors? <laughs> no, no, there was mountains of dust. Mountains and, and, and clouds of of pumice and, and silica and and you know fine dust. concrete in 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 fine form that only could have been created by extremely powerful explosives not collapse no steel building has ever collapsed because of fire including the one in london including any other in in recent history they don't fall down f from fire can I offer a little change in language? A lot of times people talk about the steel columns being exploded, but cutting charges don't explode, they just cut. They can have um, electric controls. They are or controlled by wire, wire. wire sparks, ignite the thermite. And the thermite reaches a very high temperature. 3,200 degrees. Even higher sometimes, 4,300. Right. Cut steel. And steel melts around 2,800. Right. So they slice right through. There was lots of explosions as well. The, the explosions were for the other stuff besides the steel. The concrete flooring apparently had been sprayed with this super explosive nanothermite. Okay, you may know more than me, you know, um, and, and, and God bless you, you know, you're gonna maybe help me find the killers of my best friend. Nanotechnology started about 40, 50 years ago that they discovered that if they applied lasers to make stuff smaller than ever before, that chemical processes could be changed with lasers by making the participating parts of the chemical process small. Thermate <coughs> is aluminum and ferrous oxide mm. rust. And when they combine aluminum and ferrous oxide, the oxygen goes over to the aluminum forming aluminum oxide and you get pure 
ferrous, pure iron, at a temperature of 4,000 degrees, 3,800 degrees, some very high number. And they used that way back in the 1890s to weld the railroad tracks together. And they could just put the aluminum and the rust together in sand and around both ends of the steel and the temperature would get hot enough and they would fuse. Well, I, well, I will add to that because we saw molten steel. The further down you went into the piles, we saw more and more. It was like it was like a, 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 like one of those documentaries about volcanoes. Molten steel and almost white hot, running like almost like water through you know parts of the lower end of the pile, and that stayed that way, apparently for weeks and weeks afterwards. Can I make one important statement about that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> when the thermite cutting charges were attached to the core columns by crews in the elevator shafts. The thermite, when it does its cutting, has this iron liberated from the chemical reaction. I was saying the oxygen goes to the aluminum, giving it pure iron at, say, 4,000 degrees. It cuts the steel and that iron is then free to drop down through the elevator shaft all the way to the bottom. Burning. So the molten metal is actually molten iron, not molten steel, or a combination of both, but a lot of molten iron. And a lot of people are confused. There are differences between steel and iron. Mm -hmm. <laughs> steel is a mixture of iron and carbon. Mm -hmm. Iron is a pure element, mm -hmm. and so pure iron molten does not occur except when there are cutting charges around. There isn't iron in civilized life. The only iron is maybe wrought iron furniture, mm -hmm. but, but there's plenty of steel around, but mm -hmm. there's not iron. Well, so to know, find think, molten iron, that's like an important fact. Yeah, and we, at that moment, on, on that day, I wasn't standing at a, a crime scene intellectually or, or journalistically. I didn't know anything except I wanted to see if my best friend had survived the collapse of the North Tower. You know, and peripheral things are there, the, you know, the 30-foot lengths, which had these beveled edges at 45-degree angles lying all over the place. We didn't, we didn't say, hey, look at that. That's really weird. They're all the same length, and they're all cut like that. Although we were, we were moving them, you know, like 30 or 40 of us would, would pick one of these things up just to continue to, to try to dig through it to find, hopefully find firemen or civilian survivors, you know. We, we had our hands on this stuff and we were feeling and then seeing the molten metals, you know. And well, I had blisters all over my face. The further down I went into the tower pile, oh, the heat it. was getting the heat was The heat was hundreds of degrees coming up from this roaring furnace of molten iron, if you will, uh, from underneath the North Tower, you know, and, and it blistered my face. I didn't know what it was. You know, I didn't know what I know now. I didn't even start to identify this as a Bush war, premeditated contract killing, if you will, until years after the fact, when I began to uncover and everyone else began to uncover, and, and the, you know, the metallurgic uh, physics professors from uh, Brigham Young began to investigate the fallacies that, that they presented as facts around 9-11 and the pancake theory and, and airplane fuel theory and all of these theories that never in a million years could be proved in, in a laboratory as even remotely possible to bring down the towers. You know? Let me continue. I was talking about nanotechnology. They applied nanotechnology at, at the beginning. They said, let's take this thermite reaction, and what if we make the aluminum particles and the rust particles nano size? Instead of the usual size of particles, let's make them a thousand times smaller. And they did that. They could accomplish that with lasers, mm -hmm. and they ignited it. And not only did it do what it usually does, reach this high temperature, but they found it was explosive. It popped. That when it ignited, it was a huge 
pressure wave that sent out. That's an explosion. And it's seen. It's seen. I mean, you, you know, all the news footage shows these waves of, of clouds coming out from the, from the base of the towers. You know, wa waves of, of 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 powdered pressure, like like they said, like like you only see in in volcanoes and and, and other highly pressurized explosivity right what's up with that you know so this stuff was so explosive that they said you know a little bit goes a long way why don't we paint it on and so they mixed it with paint these little particles and they painted it on and lo and behold it didn't work it didn't explode and the problem was that the paint was preventing the aluminum and the rust from touching each other Hmm. What, they, what the Brigham Young scientists discovered was the solution that was used on 9-11. What they did to solve the problem of the paint preventing the touching, what they found in the dust, the explosive that was used to paint the flooring, was aluminum and rust particles in protective nano chambers of silicon carbide. Millions and millions of little chambers of silicon carbide within the chambers were uniform size and shape, flat aluminum plates, and lots of little cubes of rust nestled together so they would touch very nicely. Nano scale now, this is like billionths of a meter. <laughs> and that's what they found in the dust. You know, Laura Lard uh, killed my mother. You know, she got hooked on Newports. And their laboratories are infamous for working out every single day more addictive chemical fish hooks to put into every single cigarette, right? My hat's off to them as uh, commerce. My Newport addiction almost killed me. And, and, and I had to stop smoking them, and I couldn't stop smoking them because of the chemical fish hooks that were in every single Newport that I smoked, right? And I was pissed off at myself because I couldn't stop smoking. And then I learned exactly what you're saying, that science in the wrong hands can be mass murderous, you know? Zyklone B for instance. What is it? Well, it's the gas used in Auschwitz, manufactured by a company, hired by the Nazis. All right? Somebody was told or, or paid or ordered to execute this in the six months or year prior to the attack by someone else. Right? Building 7 settles down into its footprint only because the CIA contractor and others were experts in their field, chemists, paid to do what? To wire the World Trade Center for destruction as a premeditated rationalization to invade Afghanistan and Iraq? And the Bush Library sits in Texas as this um, center of, of knowledge and history and learning. And, and this is the, the farce I have to live with coming home from Vietnam and understanding that war's economic rationale and the French history and the colonial history. And then this, this attack, the killing of Jack Kennedy, who was removing us from the Vietnam quagmire. So I, I spend years and years trying to organize the names of the people that contracted his killing. Because if, if he's not killed, I don't go to Vietnam. I don't get my brain and heart destroyed of my own experience there, my whole life stolen from me, while George Bush gets the only deferment in his entire Air National Guard unit 
to not get orders for Vietnam by someone in the higher ups of that ruling class ordering him to stay down and, and stay put in, in, in Louisiana and deal coke and drink and have a great time while everyone else in his unit is sent to fight and probably get shot down um, in, in the Vietnam War. This is, this is what I'm now having to live with. As what? As 9-11 truth? As history? As a tragedy and a farce? There's actually one more thing that I want to talk about, which is, which is kind of cool and weird. I came up out of the, out of the North Tower pile. Um, it was about 7 o'clock. I see something moving toward me, and the closer she came, the weirder she looked. She had a Red Cross bib on, and she had a long white dress on, and she had a wicker basket. And she uh, offered the contents of the wicker basket to me, and inside the wicker basket were bottles of wine and bottles of whiskey and cigarettes, right? And I had stopped drinking, I had stopped smoking, and my best friend was always on me, the guy who was down underneath the tower. His face just appeared in, in between me and her, right? And he had this big smile on his face, don't you dare, you know? This is a perfect opportunity to pick up booze and cigarettes again, don't you dare. And he had this, you know, this, this smile on his face, you know? Patrick, don't touch the booze or the cigarettes. When I you know, waved her off, she, she, she turned and she floated back down off the pile, right? It turns out that she was identified by others as the Red Cross ghost, an apparition who was seen in other areas of the 9-11 pile and at the Fresh Kills landfill where a lot of the big pieces uh, and, and a lot of the evidence was brought before it was put on barges and shipped to China and India for smelting. She, she was a 19th century uh, French braided, uh, old fashioned Red Cross bib with, with a long gown, ghost, the Red Cross ghost. And I get chills just talking about it because, I, cause, because the Red Cross didn't show up there until at least a day or two days later anyway and they were, and they were not allowed anywhere near the pile. They were stationed on Water Street. Speaking of who turned up early, that there's more revealing FEMA. Evidence. FEMA shows up the day before. What a, what a, oops, oops. Well, there's stuff like that laying all over the place as don't you touch that with a 10-foot pole or we'll, we know where your family lives. This is how it's done. You know, It's done without fingerprints and it's done with murderous threats and intimidation, the whitewashing. The 9-11 Commission report is Warren Commission too, for very good reasons, and all of it is as fictional as any great novel. You know, it doesn't add up. None of it adds up. As evidence, as journalistic, you know, as, as the truth, you know, 9-11 truthers, you know. I'm trying to get to the truth of this. I'm not there yet, you know, because the truth at the end of the day for me is who gave the orders, who killed Patty Brown, you know? Who killed Jack Kennedy? Who gave the orders? I want to know, because they also killed me. They killed my heart, they killed my mind, they killed my best friend, they destroyed my life, they stole my life. They turned me into a true-believing, flag-waving, commie-killing lunatic whose heart and mind was shattered by the experience again and again and again. I've identified them as a, you know, as a ruling class. I want their names so desperately, I want to, I want, I want to name the names. You know, is it the Walkers? Is it the Bushes? Is it the, you know, the, the, the Texas oligarchs? You know, who's giving the orders here? You know, who's giving the green light to this stuff? Is Langley just a separate government of its own, with its own agenda and its own pit bulls and its own corporate um, power structure and its black budgets? Who is in charge, you know? Is it Trump? Is it Carlisle Group? Who, who is in charge? Because then I'll know the truth about 9-11 and the truth about Dallas and the truth about the world and the truth about the government that um, I'm 
subject to right now still you know this dictatorship which will do anything apparently and and and, and kill anyone to to stay on top of us a, a friend of mine who was a line producer at CNN on the afternoon of 9/11 she was there at the headquarters on Columbus Circle and and she witnessed the uh, government officials who showed up and took the, the the top dogs at CNN into a room and marched them out an hour later with that look on their face and she said anecdotally later on that they were told that they are not to report a single a single thing about the attack until it was um, approved by uh, Washington and uh, and that's one thing that uh, she told me she witnessed that that, that they there was a you know a media a media coup d'etat had occurred and she and she and she saw it I brought Interviews and evidence of the evacuation of Saddam Hussein from the Baghdad, uh, from the airport, from S Saddam Hussein Airport on, on April 9th of, no of 2003. Oh. A witness who was a member of the military, who was the concrete specialist at the airport, maintaining the, the airstrips for Saddam, witnessed a ceasefire that was called between the Americans and the, uh, and the Iraqi army. Uh, while uh, a, a motorcade of Cadillac limousines, stretch limousines, rolled into the airport while the CIA was landing these unmarked C-130s, the tails go down and, this, and the Cadillacs are driven right into the tails and they take off. And he saw this happen and I have him on film. And I brought that film interview to, to CBS, to a producer there. And I started showing it to him, and after about 20 minutes of, of showing him this stuff, including the secret weapons that were used to melt uh, passenger buses, the you know the Iraq war theater was used as a as as a testing ground for postmodern weapons, um, really futurist stuff. Um, and he stopped me, and then said. Um, I am going to have to ask you to leave the building. You'll be escorted out of the building. Please turn that off. And uh, if I show this to anyone else, I will lose my job. Um, so goodbye. And, and that was one lesson of many lessons I've received. When I bring um, radioactive evidence to corporate media and how, how it's handled. It's handled um, sensorily. And, um, it's, once again, it's called the lie of omission, you know. What people don't know is what is killing them. Um, in, in terms of the, the, the truth and the knowledge and, 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 you know, and the fundamental, fundamental checks and balances of the constitutional guarantees of the fourth estate, uh, of the, uh, you know, the, the value of, of journalism as a check and balance against tyranny. And it's gone, especially you know with with network. Network is part of it, and they are the mass mass producers of the Kool Aid, you know. And they're geniuses at it, and and I know people that work inside it, and they tell me that you know that they're not there for any other reason except to collect a paycheck. They're not there to to be the next Edward R. Murrow. They make it so hypnotic that everyone is now glued to it, you know glued to it and brainwashed accordingly. And I haven't watched a minute of television in 30 years. I've never been on the internet. I've never had a cell phone. I do read four newspapers every day. And I do go to these places if I can to see for myself what's going on. And try to, you know, put piece it all together as as a version of I hope, you know, a reality-based um, truth about my life and about the world at large, you know. What is going on here? And I'm trying to stay conscious and try to st stay with it um, as, as horrific and as traumatic as it all seems to be, you know. The closer I get to the indictments of the, of the real killers here, the more sickened I become by their abuse of power and their ruthlessness, you know? Like, are they human? How could they be human and, and, and kill 3,000 innocent civilians? How could they be human? How can they get up out of bed in the morning? What is their marching orders? 
What is their agenda? To make Helmand province the world's capital for opium again after the Taliban burned the crops in, in 1999 and forbade it as haram to grow opium. And that had to be stopped right away because opium and heroin is the third largest cash business in the history of the world. 12,000 tons of raw opium were harvested last, in the last fiscal year. And somehow, magically, it winds up in New Hampshire and Vermont and the Rust Belt. And it's slaughtering thousands and thousands and thousands of young people now again. And my brother died from an overdose of heroin. So they killed my brother. They killed my mother. They killed my best friend. So it's personal. Henry, George, Dick, Donald, be scared. CIA agent makes a confession on his deathbed. Quote, we blew up the World Trade Center 7 building on 9-11. Looks like they're all coming out of the woodworks, ladies and gentlemen. Before they die, they have to alleviate their conscience, if you will. 79-year-old retired CIA agent Malcolm Howard has made a series of astonishing claims since being released from the hospital in New Jersey on Friday and told he has weeks to live. Mr. Howard claims he was involved in the controlled demolition of World Trade Center 7, the third building that was destroyed on 9-11. Mr. Howard, who worked for the CIA for 36 years as an operative, claims he was tapped by senior CIA agents to work on the project due to his engineering background and early career in the demolition business. Trained as a civil engineer, Mr. Howard became an explosives expert after being headhunted by the CIA in the early 1980s. Mr. Howard says he has extensive experience in planting explosives in items as small as cigarette lighters and as large as 80-floor buildings. The 79-year-old New Jersey native says he worked on the CIA operation they dubbed New Century between May 1997 and September 2001. During a time, he says the CIA was still taking orders from the top. Mr. Howard says he was part of a cell of four operatives tasked with ensuring the demolition was successful. Mr. Howard says the World Trade Center 7 operation is unique among his demolitions, as it was the only demolition that we had to pretend wasn't a demolition job. 